Sas and Sirs, welcome to this episode of our show. Today I'm talking to Will Brown, founder, CEO of magicform.ai. It is us an AI generative space. And there's a lot that we're unpacking today from his personal story to how he built his first minimum viable product and how you can do it as well in the same industry. Just check out the short clip to get a taste of today's talk. And so applying it to magic form, what I looked at was what are the problems I know everybody has and where are the opportunities for us to kind of like fold into their existing workflow where they can more or less set it and leave it. And what I realized from me having done a lot of advertising online is that AI live chat has sucked. It sucks. Live chat in general is great. Increases conversions 20 to 40%. But there has yet to be a time like pre-chat GBT that I've been able to talk to a chatbot and actually have a fluid end-to-end -end conversation. Today we're discussing the skill set, the mindset, and other things you need to have as a founder. And there's a lot of controversial topics and opinions even for me. So I recommend you to check out to the full episode right after this short sponsorship segment. This episode is sponsored by the SaaS Insiders Studio. We help SaaS founders build their minimum viable products, MVPs, launch quickly, find a product market fit, and grow from there. SaaS Insider Studio works with non-technical founders that are on the pre-seed or seed stage to help them execute on their product vision. To learn more, go to my LinkedIn profile that you can find in the description to this episode and shoot me a direct message there. All right, let's jump straight into today's episode. SaaS Insiders, I welcome you to this episode of our show. Today, I am more excited than ever because today with me on a call, Will Brown, the founder of Magic Form, and today we're going to talk about SaaS, but also about AI and what is happening right now, because it's a very hot topic. A lot of people are confused about certain things, about products that you can ship about it. And Will Brown is one of those guys who are crushing it and doing it consistently. And today we're going to cover all of those details. With that said, Will Brown, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Vlad. For those who might not know you yet, if you could give one or two minute introduction of who you are, what kind of background you're coming from, and what you're working on right now. Awesome. Yeah, sure. So I have a pretty roundabout background. I grew up in a on a farm in Northern Virginia, uh, you know, where the closest house was a mile away. And we had hay and animals and all that. And so I had a lot of free time on my hands. And that free time manifested itself into boredom and then video games, because it was a lot more interesting than you know, talking to the animals on the farm, being able to play these online games, faster feedback loops, just, you know, more interesting. And so I would take a bus to school and every single day I started to kind of get this sense, even when I was in elementary school. So first, second, third grade that, wait a second, something seems off here because there was conversations around like in our English class about handwriting and they were teaching me, you need to learn how to write legibly. I said, why? computers are coming, isn't it obvious? And they said, well, you still need to do this. And I said, why? And they didn't have an answer. And then in math class, they'd be trying to get me to make sure I was prioritizing, you know, memorizing how to do long division. And again, I said, why? And I was not really impressed with their answer. And it just seemed to me that I had this unique perspective because I, I grew up and technology was kind of having its moment i you know i got a game boy in in uh, when i was in kindergarten and then the iphone came out when i was in fourth grade and i saw this kind of coming i saw this as an inevitable wave that was going to sweep up humanity and carry it with it and did not seem like the education system was pivoting on a dime it didn't seem like they were being proactive and the more that i looked into it and the more that i actually took my time and rather than doing history homework I looked into the history of the education system and I saw that it was built for the industrial revolution, right? I saw that it was built to have people do repetitive things over and over and over again, because back in the industrial revolutions, the machines weren't intelligent by themselves. They still needed humans to run them. And so that kind of corrupted education for me. And so all of my actual curiosity started getting put into things that weren't 
education, which like, for example, in, uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I was mining Bitcoin when I was at $600 per coin and everyone thought I was crazy. And I have the emails trying to get my parents and my grandparents, my entire capital network at the time to invest in. They all said no. And so I uh, eventually got scammed because I had my coins on an exchange. My power supplies kept melting in my miners. So I had like extension cords running across the whole house. And I just, I just knew in that moment that if I was in my mid twenties or thirties and had resources, I would have been able to create a warehouse of these miners. And, you know, I would probably be on a rocket ship right now, honestly. And so that moment, that lesson that I got, Trans, it transpired into when I was 16 that I went to a real estate investing seminar with my mom. She invited me completely random. She said, hey, this is something you might find interesting. And there over the course of a couple of days, I learned you can actually buy and sell and flip properties. And it doesn't have to be the conventional putting 20% down with a good credit score. As a 16 year old, I had zero credit and zero money because again, I lost it all to the Bitcoin scam. And so that was really interesting to me. So I spent the last couple of years of high school learning everything I could about real estate investing. I, I finished high school. I go to college for one year. And after one year of college, again, all of my mental space had been put directly just towards real estate investing because I'm kind of obsessive and just go all into one thing. And I dropped out and I linked up with a couple guys that I met at a meetup and we started to flip a couple houses. We started to do our first couple of deals. And a year and a half later, we had done like 150 house flips and I owned half a dozen rental properties and was set as a 19 year old. And I saw that the kind of the rewards that come from just focusing on one thing and compounding and not being distracted or not chasing shiny objects really paid off. And that got me to the point where I was like, all right, I don't really know what I should do next besides just do more of what I've already been doing. And so we were buying and selling properties in Virginia Beach at the time. And we said, let's take this thing nationwide. And I tried to scale our systems. I tried to scale the very things that made us successful, which is having a large amount of high quality relationships with people who were possibly interested in selling their house, right? That's all the real estate game was. And I tried to scale that to other markets and it didn't work because other people didn't, weren't as passionate as I was. Other people weren't as good as following the system that I created as I was, but I was like, I'm also limited on time. And so I looked at a future of what I could do is if I had followed the roadmaps of everyone that had came before me and said, let me just hire and let me just train. And these are just the realities of what it's like to build a business. You have to hire, you have to fire. Some people will stay, but don't ex expect this to kind of be the, the reason you get bottlenecked. And I said, no way. I'm just, again, kind of that, I just, I just don't buy it. I think the world's changing. And I knew that there must be some sort of technology I could train to talk to my customers for me, to manage and juggle these relationships with people wanting to sell their houses. And there wasn't Vlad. It was depressingly bad how terrible chatbots were in 2019. And I realized that, wait a second, this isn't just an opportunity for real estate. This is a goldmine opportunity that could be applied to every business and clean up these issues and give people the tools to be able to actually standardize exceptional customer experiences. So been head down in that ever since. How did that understanding of a problem, how did that transition into magic form? Is that something you've been working on for quite some time as a business? Or did that just recently came as an opportunity of the recent uh, models that were being trained and launched? Yeah, so Magic Form uh, was started in like November of 2022, so about like four months ago. And but since 2019, I because again I don't have a technical background, I've been teaching myself how to code, kind of getting caught up to speed, trying to figure out, wait a second, why are computers so bad at talking to human beings? What are the what are the missing pieces that do, you know that that they need to be able to be really good? And so being in that space, we had built some niche applications for real estate investors like myself. And then when ChatGPT came along and I could see it writing code, I could see it pulling in context from previous conversations, I realized, got visibility on what those missing pieces were, which is, it's all about context. It's all about the machine's ability to look at in order to determine what should be said, looking at the things that were not said. And we as human beings do that naturally. But machines only have ever processed what is right in front of them. But with large language models, they have the ability to pull in context from other conversations, from other information that's been across, you know, that's happened that human beings have put on the internet to kind of fill in those gaps and give it that 
common sense understanding that has been missing all along. Once we saw that and we saw that this should no longer just be contained to real estate, we should build this to be industry agnostic. And it's uh, it's been a lot of fun ever since. So if we were to start back in November, when you have an idea and we need to build it, a lot of SaaS insiders that are watching us are not technical at all. So meaning they know, they see the market, they see the opportunity, but a lot of times they struggle to, to ship the product because they lack knowledge, relevant, relevant skills, and frankly, the experience of shipping SaaS products. It would be curious to know, how did you go about building your product? Did you just build it all by yourself? Or did you leverage some other tools, people, technologies? Like, how did that happen? How did it go from this idea to the first customer that you have on the market? Yeah, so my co-founder and CTO is originally from Singapore. Uh, this guy's wicked smart. And he and I started working together a couple years ago on some of these applications, but he actually had a technical background. So he came from UCLA, electrical engineering, computer science. And along the way, he's kind of been like, you know, the college education that I never had because I dropped out and a mentor for me in real time while we've been building this together. I would say if somebody's like wanting to build software today, you and ChatGPT alone can get to an MVP. Truly, you don't need to get an outsourced software development firm. You don't need even anyone else. If you want it and you are willing to kind of do the research, ChatGPT has essentially synthesized the knowledge of a ton of developers and all the code that they've written. And if, as long as you have the patience to go through and ask the questions and iterate and you know piece it together and you have a complete picture for what you want to build, and there's actually a problem that you're trying to solve, and you actually have seen that this new technology can solve that problem, ChatGPT, get on there, say, where do I start to learn how to code? What types of things? You can literally talk to it like it's your technical co-founder and get you to the place where you can build something. I'm in Silicon mm. Valley. I'm here in San Francisco. And there's a common meme, right? That's like, hey, I've got an idea. I just need someone to build it. Anyone who's willing to take you up on that is probably not the person that you want building your app because anyone mm. who's really good is going to have a bunch of other opportunities with people that probably have more than just an idea. So six months ago, this was a different story. But today, you and ChatGPT, try it out. If you haven't started coding with it, if you're like, I'm not technical, break that ice, break that seal, get in there. Because I don't know if there's any opportunity for people who are just kind of like ideas people, given that the barrier to entry for people that actually want to convert their ideas into an MVP who want to start getting customers is so low, it's lower than it ever has been before. And you don't need to rely on anyone else. So even if you're working a job and you've got an idea and you see an insight into this industry, you see an inefficiency and you have a, an idea you can start to experiment and, you know, a couple hours a day. And like within a couple of weeks, you should be able to have something standing up because it can help you fill in all the gaps for it. I think I can, I can definitely agree on the point that you can get to the MVP probably with ChatGPT. I'm currently experimenting myself. I think so far I wrote maybe four lines of code, the ones that it struggled with. But what do you think about the learning curve? Like if, for example, I've, I've never coded like in my life before. How do you think would be the, the timeline that would take me to to get to that position where I can actually know what to query the ChatGPT for. Yeah. And is this somebody kind of like in a vacuum? Do they have any technical friends around them? Do they have anyone else, okay. any human beings around them that know how to code? <laughs> That's in a vacuum, real stories. Like, for example, people that are running e-commerce businesses that haven't coded like in their life before. Uh, they have technical people around them, but they've never opened the console. And how complex of MVP are we? Talk well, about. we don't want to make MVP complex, obviously. MVP is something that can be built in 30, between 30 and 60 days, I would say. Yeah. And is this person able to devote full time to this? Probably like part time, okay. maybe like 20, 20 hours per week. And it's a, I'm assuming we're talking like a large language model application, right? Where you're just connecting to the AI and you're taking a text input to get a text output for something. Is that the type of application we're mm. talking about or any application? We we'll would probably make it a bit more complex, a bit more complex. Maybe it will involve working with data, for example, like maybe analyzing video content and giving some specific recommendations on it, for example. I would say 
60 to 90 days uh, start start to finish where you can actually have a freestanding app. And as long as the person is resourceful and long as the long as the person is like is able to teach themselves things well with someone else, right? Like ChatGPT isn't a full technical mentor, but it can get most of the way there. But in the cases where it is wrong, which sometimes it is wrong, someone who has kind of like even small research abilities to take a look at what other people are saying, get on Stack Overflow and talk to other human beings if they don't have kind of like a technical mentor. But I would recommend to these people like squat up, right? Find some people in your life that are technical, find some people that have a vision. And if you guys are like, look, we want to build something, right? If you don't want your app to just be built and then knocked out by Google's next set of updates, right? You got to be kind of thinking far out in advance and probably start starting to think about assembling the team to, to do so. Unless you want to just kind of like build something to make your existing business better and not necessarily bring it to the world. That sounds pretty ambitious. That sounds pretty ambitious, I would say, from my experience. Going back to Magic Form, when you say you launched in November, does it mean like the product already launched or you just started working on it? No, we just started like the code. We cloned a repo gutted the repo from our just niche real estate application with the suite of what was everything that worked, what was everything that didn't work and pretty much started from scratch. But we had the knowledge in our head of best practices for conversational AI applications. We launched mm. uh, late January, like as a soft launch on one time. Okay. And you started in November. With basically like a, basically based off your existing repos. Yes, and we, and we launched with a the MVP of MVPs. What do you think is your philosophy on building MVPs? Meaning, when you're looking at the product and you want to launch it, like as a founder, you have a vision of you know version number seven. How do, how do you keep yourself focused on the MVPs? What are the practices? What are the I would say what are the principles that you guide yourself with to to make it a, an actual MVP? not like save the hunger in the world kind of scope. Yeah, I think I have the privilege of having had success in real estate made me think I was smarter than I was, which had me hit a wall really quickly when it came to software development and realized just how little I actually know in state, right? Just how little I know what other people actually want across all mm -hmm. sorts of industries. And so I said, okay, well, if I don't know, if I, if I kind of have this general sense, right, how quickly can we start getting our customers in the loop? How quickly can we actually, how much, like if there's a favorite, I have a famous quote that I'm a big fan of. It's like, a, and it's a, put into a good song too, which is that a man who thinks all the time has only thoughts to think about. And so he becomes lost in a world of his own illusions. And I definitely resonated with that because there was times when I was, you know, kind of like initially starting to build software a couple of years ago where I had the answer. I knew exactly what people would want. I knew exactly what the solution needed to be, or I should say, at least I thought I did. And it was going to be perfect and we're going to launch it. And people are just going to wire me millions of dollars right away. Not how it goes. And so having had that experience, I realized that I am set in the direction right, in building a, a platform that allows people to train and hire their own AI employees to handle the different parts of the customer journey when it comes to the customer communication. I got all that, but there's a lot of things and a lot of decisions along the way that I said, let's just, let's just let our customers kind of figure this out for us, right? Let's just include them in the conversation. And let's make them feel really heard. Let's make them feel really valued. So I started up a Discord, right? And there's like a dozen people at the beginning. And I would just have conversations with the customers. And it wasn't Will and Will's co-founder building things for people. It was us building them with those people who are actually sharing their real needs. And so our contact with the reality was stronger. And therefore, our ability to realize reality and to understand how can we change their reality was also much stronger than it was me with my perceptions around how the world works for other people and what other people want. So this is kind of like the cliche, talk to customers. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I got started, sounds great. I'm smarter than you are. Let me go and figure this out. It's, I get why everybody says that now. And to the extent of like saying, do that, I really can't, if someone's listening to this and like, no, no, Will, I know what my customers want. 
go go try it out, right? Go go see for yourself. This is something that I had to learn experientially. If you're smart, you can listen to me and the 99.999% of people that'll say the same thing. Or you can do what I did and be stubborn and go try and think that you're smarter than everyone else and waste a lot of money and a lot of time doing so. So Sass and Cyrus, I really want you to pick this up because Will just went through it himself. And it feels like recently because you're still passionate about this. Oh, yeah. Which is you do your market research in a way that you are talking to your customers. And I think the, the way you, I love that you did it is you, you made an actual community on Discord, right? And you were just basically asking like what, what kind of problems they have. What exactly was the framework of you kind of finding that product market fit? Like what exactly if you were to share a few steps, if, if you were to do it over again and you work in the other industry, how would you approach that? You know, something that's interesting about Magic Form is even though we're, you know, growing week over week and we've got, you know, a couple thousand signups and a bunch of people actively using it. And now we're just beginning to actually talk about marketing and scale is we've captured a lot of free attention because we were just positioned well, the timing is well, right? I've been in this space. I've been patient. I still can't tell you exactly what industry this is best for. I can't tell you exactly, is this better for SaaS companies? Is this better for education companies, for landscaping companies, right? And so to that extent, there's, I still am kind of breaking the rules because I don't, like we have a clear in terms of market segments, in terms of, you know, our demographics of our users, but in terms of exactly what industry they're in, I been burned by trying to just build things for one industry because I have this technology of like, this could do so much more, but it's so limited. And so applying it to magic form, what I've looked at was what are the problems I know everybody has and where are the opportunities for us to kind of like fold into their existing workflow where they can more or less set it and leave it. And what I realized from me having done a lot of advertising online is that AI live chat has sucked. It sucks. Live chat in general is great. Increases conversions 20 to 40%. But there has yet to be a time like free chat GBT that I've been able to talk to a chatbot and actually have a fluid end-to-end -end conversation. And so I also realized that you can't have human beings monitoring live chat because they just don't scale. You need an army of people. They don't all learn from each other, right? It's not a hive mind. The response times are slow. They screw up. They, they don't show up. They quit. You have to retrain people. That's a lot of the problem. And so I said, okay, now that this technology is general, why don't I just actually see if I can put some sort of magnet out there for all the early adopters, for all the people wanting to use technologies like this, and I'll let their desire and passion for novelty help us figure out exactly what this needs to be, exactly how we should upload the data, exactly what that user experience should look like, exactly what the code deployment part of it should look like. And so to that extent, I there's a lot of people that are really excited about AI. And we were kind of just like perfectly positioned again, because I was patient and I saw this coming on the horizon, that I let those people come to me and I basically said, hey, I have an offer. And I came out of the gate with a very basic, more or less a proof of concept. And then people started signing up and they started referring to friends. And they started telling me, hey, will it be great if we could do this? Hey, will it be great if I, we could do this? And I filtered everything to say, how can I just do the things that they're asking me for, but that are also going to be beneficial to everyone? And so early adopters are beautiful because they'll tell you everything that you need to do, right? You just have to position yourself and kind of like, you know, set the ego aside to be able to actually listen. And if nobody's coming to you and you're building something in a hot space and nobody's interested in what you have to build, it's probably not because the product's not far along enough yet, but it's probably because you're missing some core mechanic as to, you know, maybe how they do business or how conversions actually work, uh, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. a bit more research then as well would probably be required. So that's what okay. I, if I could go back and do anything differently, it would probably build more structure around how to onboard people. How do I do more interviews? Because it was very much kind of like a opt-in. If people wanted to give me feedback, they could, but I could have interviewed every single one of them and gotten, you know, complete demographic profiles of them, exactly what the pain points are, exactly how this solution could help them. I kind of just like built, did it on the fly with all these, these users, but I would probably just go deeper with them at the very beginning. One thing you've mentioned is, you're trying to build a product not for a particular industry, meaning that, for example, Magic Form is 
can be applied to pretty much any industry if, if, if you know what you're doing. How do you go about gathering such a community? Like what would be the thing that would make them feel in common, make them compelled to join whatever Discord or whatever other source of community that you have? Yeah, there's, this is simply a matter of that. This is, I can, I, this is all about just our positioning. People are asking the question of how do I use this thing? How can this, how can this new technology that everybody's excited about benefit for me? And they're trying to get to an answer, right? The no, the society hasn't really figured out. We haven't even come close to say, how is it going to figure out? And I just position myself as, hey, we're a tool that uses this technology to help you do this. So we're in that path of progress. And so while people are looking for their answers, while they're looking to do research, they're taking an inventory of what problems they have, of what things they think this could potentially be applied to. And then they're going out and doing research. And different newsletters and like uh, AI tool aggregator sites picked us up and just listed us. And like still on a lot of them, we're like the only one under sales because most of the other people build like email writers or copywriters or things like that. And so they came to us because we just position ourselves between where they are and where they want to be. That's it. You were mentioning about, and I'm asking those questions because on the Sassan behalf, but also on, on my behalf, a little bit of self, uh, selfishness here as well. Like when you define your product, right? When you create this kind of messaging, the positioning, do you, do you go from the problem perspective that you're solving or from the technology perspective? Like, how do you go about explaining to people what are you about and what kind of things you're trying to solve? Yeah, I would say for 99.99% of the time, you don't even need to ever talk about how you do it. You just need to do it. You just need to show what you do, right? Most Americans don't care how their medicine actually works in their body, right? That's the technical part of the drug, right? It interacts with these enzymes and it does these different things. Nobody cares. Sorry, not nobody. A very small percentage of people care, right? People who make the, the drugs. Everyone else just wants it to solve their problem or make them feel better. That's it. It's the same thing with a piece of software. It's the same thing. Most people don't care at all. I don't have a single one of our customers that have asked me, or have gone to any level of depth to, okay, well, how are you specifically taking the data from here and then you're doing this thing with it and then you're doing this thing with it so then it magically does this thing. They don't, they don't care. They just see that it does that and they just use it. So what I would say is speak to the problem, uh, speak to the solution, speak to you know how is this going to make people feel. Like on our website, it says two words, it's like sales simplify, right? That's it because our target market doesn't have a simple solution to be able to standardize and kind of like optimize their conversions. They just, they just don't. They're like web SEO. There's a lot of people that are focused on driving traffic to the website. But after that, it's kind of like a complicated, what are they going to go build out their own AI product? Are they going to go to try and fly, like hire a call center in Pakistan and manage those people? Like it gets very complicated. And so what we bring is a consistently simple solution. Yes, it uses AI. But they can have one conversation with the chatbot on our site, and it'll answer all their questions by actually showing how it works rather than just like telling people about it in a white paper. And so knowing your audience is key, because if you're building something technical and you're building it for technical people, probably speak to the technical things. But if you're not building for technical people, you don't need to, don't, don't bother. You're just, just don't even, don't even try. It's not worth it. You're just going to lose them. They're going to drone you out. They're going to move on to somebody else where they can easily understand what it is that you do. There, there's a saying that, you know, when you start overloading your customers with things they don't understand, they get confused and confused minds say no. Meaning that if I'm a non-technical person and I'm getting a bunch of technical things, I'm confused and I'm not sure I get this. I might be getting something wrong. And, and you go, go on with your kind of research. So basically trying to make it on their level of understanding how this thing works is what I'm hearing. Yeah, or even better show, don't tell. Right. If you can show them, if you can let them, put, if, you, if you're building a chatbot, right, let them ask a question. Let your chatbot give them the answer rather than you trying to tell them everything about how it's going to theoretically work. People's test for reality is physical and it's sensory, right? If I can tell you about some, you know, made up island where there's unicorns flag, I can go into a lot of detail. 
but you're going to still be skeptical, especially if it's something that you have not seen or perceived before versus if I say, well, Vlad, can I, can I FaceTime you? Right. While I'm, while I'm there, is that cool? That's a little bit more trust or Vlad, can I, can I buy you a ticket and you can actually come experience this island for yourself, right? So the more contact that the customers actually get with the actual product, the more trust is going to be built if it works. Where if you don't have a product that works, I don't recommend marketing or trying to sell it to everyone. I recommend iterating to get it to work. But sometimes you'll find that people who don't really have anything, it's kind of a strategy to confuse the customer, smoke and mirror them, make things seem really complicated and really technical and really advanced mm -hmm. because there's not actually anything underneath. The best products are the simplest ones to understand. Where do you, where do you gather your entre entrepreneurial acumen? Because you've got a really, a really cool, interesting insights in terms of understanding user psychology and how to approach about conveying the problem and the solution. Do you think you could name maybe two to three resources that impacted you the most in the, in the, in the recent years? Maybe books, inspirational speakers, mentors, communities, anything that you think contributed in a significant manner to, to who you are today as a founder? So you're saying outside of just kind of like lived experience and outside oh, yeah, of yeah. just... Well, I mean, okay. we are who we are by, by surrounding, by you know, hearing some thoughts because we are the combination of people, books, and everything else that we heard around it, right? And processed in a certain way. So if you were, maybe there is some, some read that you recently consumed and, and inspired you to, to change something in how you do business. Maybe, maybe the person, the community. I would say moving to San Francisco, which I did in October from Los Angeles. Kind of like that thing that we were talking about, like that, that test for reality, right? We're talking about, you know, believing that there's unicorns on the, on the island, believing that building a software company is possible is much easier if you're staring face to face and can like grab the person that did that, right? And you can just like hear what they say. What they say is going to carry so much more weight and is going to rewire your brain. Because again, you have much more content. It's not somebody writing about something or somebody talking on stage about something. I've read a ton of books. I done a ton of personal development, business, professional development, done all those programs. I feel like all of that got me somewhere, but got me it was inferior by itself. Because if you're trying to do something that's never been done before, only real way to see that you can do that is to stand face to face with someone else that has done that and see they are no different than me. Now, how, right? It's all about the, it's all about the belief to start with. And then it's about I've had a couple of people that say, like, I used to ask a lot of technical questions of people, but when I first moved here, an entrepreneur that I really respect, I pretty much asked them the question. I was like, hey, would you focus on this or would you focus on this? And it was like two technical nonsense things. There's a terrible question. He said, well, do you have people using it? And do you have people paying for it? That's the signal. Everything else is noise. And that really hit me because I had a lot of respect for him. Someone else could have said that to me and it might not have landed as well. And so I would say the best thing has been just surround yourself and get into the room with people that you admire, right? Kind of whatever that takes. So you can prove to yourself that hey, this is doable. This is real. I can do this. And whatever piece of advice that they give you, especially if it pisses you off, don't dismiss it. Really think about it, especially if it's like, that's a terrible idea. That's not going to work. Like, don't become defensive. Listen to them. And so I did that again and again and again and again and again. I kept kind of like iterating. And the next day I'd go out to, you know, another event again here in San Francisco. This was not happening where I was before. So if you're a community, if you're not living in a city of other people doing the same thing that you're going to trying to do, decades behind because of how quickly things are moving. So find, get into a community of in person and go up to somebody and just, you know, lay it all out on the line and say, this is what I'm doing. You know, do you think it's going to work? What do you think about this idea? Do you like, what do you think about this? And doing that again and again and again and again will just save you so much time before you even write a line of code, before you even incorporate the company, right? Because you want to make sure you're directionally correct. Because as a, one of my early mentors said, like, you can run really fast and you can run really hard for a long time. But if you're running west trying to see the sunrise, you're never going to get there. And so making sure you're directionally correct is something that is 
non-obvious. And there's so many companies starting even today that I, it's clear to me they did not get enough arrows in their back. They did not have enough debates on. They did not ask enough people to try and rip them down and tear their ideas down before they went out and build it. And so when you don't do that ahead of time, the market's going to do it to you because again, that's that's reality. So contact with reality. That's it's it's everything. What do you think inspired you to move to San Francisco? I was in Los Angeles. It was almost like I don't I didn't know what I didn't know, but mm -hmm. I did know that I knew more about software development than anyone else in my life, anyone else I'd ever met. And I said, that's a real problem because I don't know anything, right? And no one I know here knows anything. And I was in Los Angeles for three years. I moved around different parts of the city. And I said, all right, where is it more likely that I can find people who understand software development? Probably where people are actually building software, right? Probably where the companies that are actually building the software that I use every day exist. And those employees are in those towns, living their lives, going out, going to meetups, going to parties. Let me, let me take a guess. Let me take a shot. So I packed everything into my car, sold all the furniture, right? Cleaned up all my loose ends and, and drove on up out of the search, out of a, really a desperation of saying, look, because again, I came from Virginia. I don't come from this world. I need to find the people that have done this before. And I need to bow down to them as a humble student and just learn because I'm willing to acknowledge that I know nothing and that everything is, if I keep trying to figure it out myself, it's just me 10 times harder than it has to be. Well, keep, keeping the beginner mentality is sometimes hard, especially if you are working you know, one, two, three, five, ten 10 years into business. Sometimes people find it hard because they want to know it all. I think you shared with me like how you wanted to be kind of the person who, who tried to figure things out, like skipping important steps of, of learning the market. So yeah. I, I, I applaud you on, on, that, on that point. What do you think fundamentally you would do differently if you had an option from your perspective right now. So now you learned quite a few things, I assume, since November. If you were to get a second chance of building Magic Form, do you think you, you, you would change anything in the approach that you take? Yeah, I would have started learning how to code three years ago rather than six to nine months ago. Because the amount of just, I would be able to hire engineers better. I would be able to think through ideas better. I would be able to understand things better. If you want to mm -hmm. build a software company, right? You should know how to write software. Now I got away with this in real estate. I didn't, I don't know how to build a house. I don't know how to frame a house. I don't know how to put a roof on because I realized that that for very early on, I was like trying to be very efficient and just only focus on the high dollar per hour activities. And so I was able to get away with not actually doing the work myself on houses. I could hire mm. contractors and manage contractors and maintain a point of leverage. With software though, it was a completely different animal and I was blindsided, much mm. more complex. And especially if it's you and your vision that you're trying to bring into the world because you see the way things are and you see there's a way things could be and there's the tools that exist, but no one's put them together in the right way. It's, it's hard to hire a contractor to build your vision. Mm. If, you're not even clear on that because nobody's clear on their, every, you can be clear on the vision, but the path, the approach, the game plan is iteration. That's the name of the game. And so that's where I screwed up. But if I had learned how to code earlier on, if I had actually learned how to, you know, hammer the nails and frame the house and, you know, lay the drywall and wire it up and plumb the, plumb my own software, hmm. I wouldn't have been so fooled by my own ignorance. I, probably say and i it's no one else like no one took advantage of me right it's just i didn't know what i didn't know they didn't know what they didn't know and just was a bunch of people not really knowing what they were doing trying to tackle something that was very very difficult a lot of valuable lessons came from that though a lot of, a lot of pain a lot of suffering but you know i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either because it ended me doing like a four day just silent meditation no technology no conversations and one of the things that I got from that conversation was just trying to get back to the source of it and said, how did I, how did I get here? This isn't exactly where I wanted to be. And it was, okay, I am kind of, tr I'm trying, I'm, it's time for me to be the student again, to say the, to say the most in the least amount of words, it's time to be the student. So I pack my bags. So basically investing in your skills early on so that, because skills is basically what you need. Sometimes when you're liking the key skills and building a business, that's, that's where this gap is happening. 
Yeah, and and the network of people that are the same stage of life as you doing what you want to do. That's important, right? I had I've had a lot of older mentors for a long time, different stage of life, different area. I thought that their business wisdom would, you know, cross over and to some degree it did, but in the areas that it didn't, I paid a price. Let's say I'm a SaaS insider, I'm listening to this episode. And if there's like just one core message I can take out of this before we'll be wrapping our conversation, I always love to ask this. What do you think is the main message if we could, if we could package it in one or two sentences from our episode? That is the only thing that, that the listener is hearing. And is ever just because just I feel like I could give a different one line or a most important thing to different groups. Is this like somebody who's maybe wanting to start their own SaaS company or who's this yeah. person? Yeah, the person who's looking to start SaaS company. They have industry knowledge. They're looking to get started. They just don't know how to get from idea to the product on the market. This yeah. guidance. This advice is going to probably piss a lot of people off, but move to San Francisco. That's it. You move to San Francisco and you immerse yourself in a world of the smartest people who are ambitious, who are extremely focused, who are on the cutting edge, and who are also generous and wanting to work and just build the future of humanity together. The amount of just wisdom that you'll get through osmosis of just breathing the same air sounds crazy. Seriously, I would like if I was a, you know, a venture capitalist, which I'm not, I would probably for especially because I know other people outside of San Francisco might think it's like, you know, just homeless people and needles on the street. So like, they just have no idea what's actually happening in some of the pockets of these cities. It's nothing but pure magic. I would probably say that the same exact founder with the same exact intelligence, the same exact drive is 10 times or higher, more likely to succeed if they're living in San Francisco than if they're not. Seriously, immersion is so key. Things are moving so quickly. The game is changing radically. And if you're not there understanding how and why and where it's going, you're just going to be in this perpetual reaction mode because you're disconnected from the source of the disruption itself. That's a pretty powerful, that's a pretty powerful statement here. Well, for those who want to connect with you, who wipes with what you're trying to say, maybe they're seeking some advice, or maybe they're looking to help on you on your journey. What do you think would be the best ways to get in touch? We'll be listing your basically social links, or like email. Like, what do you think would be best to reach out? Yeah, I try and spend not too much time on on social media, but I'm on Twitter at Will Brown AI, and yeah, I would love to. Especially, like, I'd really love to hear from the people who are building something or they're dealing with some sort of problem, I'm happy to even jump on a quick call with you. I just love to always pay it forward. Or if you're like, all right, well, I hear what you're saying. I'm willing to try on that moving to San Francisco is the best thing. Here's what I've got going for me. Hit me up. I can help you find a place. I can help be your on-ramp to the city as I had one person be for me. And that made all the, the difference. So hit me up on Twitter, Will Brown AI. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you so much on this. To wrap up, what do you think would be the concluding thoughts for our conversation today? What note we should we should end this this music on? Yeah, we didn't speak a whole lot to how the game is changing. I of course have my my ideas, but AI is uh, is here, and it's a, it's not just a wave; it's a tsunami, and the ramifications and the compounding amount of disruption is unparalleled. You can't even compare it to the industrial revolution. You can't compare it to the internet age. It's because it's compounding on top of those as well. And so something to note is that my personal belief is that every time AI does work, society becomes a little wealthier. Let me say that again. Every single time an AI does a job that a human being used to do or would be otherwise required to do, all of society benefits from that. And so build AI and build it in such a way that it's competitive because it's going to drive the cost down. And just like how technology is deflationary, there's a lot of problems in society. But why I get up and every day and do what I do is that I believe that we can keep driving the cost of living down and down and down and down and down and the quality of life higher up for everybody that this technology touches, which now that we have the internet can pretty much be everybody. And that we can actually get to a place where, yes, there's going to be massive disruptions. Yes, there's going to be massive job losses. But if the cost of living, net cost of living as a human being is free, right? We can buy ourselves some time to figure out these existential questions of 
okay, we've built the perfect set of tools now and we're a hundred person village as a society. It makes the food, it cooks the food, it makes our clothes, it builds the housing, everything's taken care of. What do we do now, right? Rather than reacting with fear or saying we need to stop this, you can't stop a tsunami. You just, you just can't. So don't, don't try. You might be able to postpone it, but even if the U.S. comes out with regulation, we're in an international multiplayer environment. And so thinking about how can we, you know, adopt this in such a way that are healthy and that spread the benefits equally to everyone who touches this technology to ultimately get to a place where we have a zero or a negative cost of living and perhaps a sustainable universal basic income could be created and shared while we figure out this transition from value created by these machines out of thin air. So it's like completely maybe a much a much bigger context than the conversation we just had, but but th that's my why. That's why I get up every single day and I do this and I realize that, you know, is this going to be happening in 10 years? Probably not. Something else is going to be happening in 10 years and then 10 years after that. And that if there's ever a time to have a profound impact on society in the direction that this takes and how the world adopts this technology, it's now, and it's really, you know, your, your impact is going to be amplified if you move to San Francisco. So that's the last thing I'm, I, I'm big on San Francisco, move here, hit me up, come build with people at the cutting edge of society. And uh, yeah, that was, sort of, those would be my closing thoughts. Will Brown, everyone. Will, I thank you so much for taking your time to join on the show with me. Thanks, Vlad. It was fun. Sass and Cyrus, we'll see you in the next episode.